turn to your Bibles. We're walking in wisdom, and I want you to go over to Proverbs 16. We're going to be looking at verse 20. This is Proverbs again, Proverbs 16, and I'll give you the title here in just a minute, but I wanted to read this scripture to you. It's just one verse, but listen to what it says. It says, He that handleth a matter wisely shall find good and whoso trusteth in the lord happy is he so we see here that proverbs speaks here of the wisdom of thinking clearly and carefully so it's giving you that that's the wisdom that not to rush into things but to think clearly and carefully about the things that you're about to do but it goes on to say here, he that handleth the matter wisely shall find good, and whoso trusteth in the Lord happy is he. So it's God's word is also letting us know here that the most crucial aspect of, of clear thinking and careful thinking is to trust in God's truth over everything else. Because there's a lot of things out there, a lot of voices out there, a lot of, of opinions out there. But the only opinion that matters, the only truth that matters is the truth of what God says about a situation that you're in. So the Word of God is telling you to, to handle a matter wisely, carefully, and clearly, but to do it trusting in the Lord. But it also goes on to tell us in the, really the last part of this, it tells us that the man or the, the person that is happy and blessed is the person who puts their trust in the Lord. That's the person that's blessed. That's the person that's happy. And that word happy there is talking about or describing the heavenly delight that you feel when you are right with God and when you trust God. And so you and I, we face many matters in our life, different situations. In fact, that word matter means situations or, or, or things that come up. You know what matter means. It means it's talking about the things that you are, will face in your life. And you and I face many matters in our life. But I want to talk to you this morning. The, the Word of God gives us a, a particular matter that is the greatest matter that you and I will face. And over in the book of Matthew, we run across a guy in Matthew 27, named Pontius Pilate. Many of y'all will know who he is or understand I've heard his name called out. But Pontius Pilate in verse 22, what is happening is that Jesus is on trial before Pilate. He's standing before Pilate. And what happens is, is Pilate has this situation or this matter has come in to his hands. Jesus has been presented to him and listen to what he says in verse 22 he says what shall i do then with jesus which is called christ and so this is a the greatest question it's the the greatest matter in your life there's nothing more important to you today than what shall i do or what shall you do with jesus what shall you do with him and so we're asked that same question so as Pilate was, as Jesus was before Pilate, Jesus is before you this morning. And as we look at this, as, as Jesus is in Pilate's hands, Jesus is in your hands this morning. But I want you to understand this. But one day Pilate will stand before Jesus, and one day I will stand before Jesus, and so will you. And it'll be the question will be this: What did you do with Jesus? What did you do with Jesus, which is called Christ? So I want to talk about Pilate a little bit, and I want you to see the dilemma that he's in, and what he goes through, and what happens to him. Because it's so easy, so many times, to 
to look at something, read something, and think, and, and say, well, he should have done this, he should have done that. But as we go through this, you'll see the things he dealt with that you deal with too. But the question's always going to come down to this. What are you doing with Jesus? And so I want you to look here at the voices that confronted Pilate. And the first voice, we see that it was the voice of reason. In Matthew 27, 18, it says this, For he knew that for envy they had delivered him. So the voice of reason, he, he knew, Pilate knows that Jesus has done nothing wrong. And the, the voice of reason spoke to him. So this is what he says again. For he knew that for envy they had delivered him. So the voice of reason was speaking to Pilate, saying, wait a minute. You, you need to do the right thing here. You got Jesus. This, this matter is in your hands. You need to do the right thing here. And the same thing with you and I. If you'll look at the, in the listen to the voice of reason and, and without being, and, and just sit back and, and look at all the evidence and all the creation, all that God has done, it is easy to see that God is the creator of all things. And Jesus is exactly who he said he is. And he's exactly who he said he was and exactly who he, he said he is. And so Pilate is dealing with that, that voice of reason. is speaking to him. He's not done anything wrong. He knows, he knows what they're doing. They're doing this for envy's sake. He knows this. He's dealing with this in his mind. But then there was also the voice of a loved one that spoke to Pilate about this, that confronted him. In verse 29 of Matthew 27, it says, His wife sent unto him, saying, have thou, nothing, have thou nothing to do with that just man? So God had spoken to Pilate's wife and had warned, had warned her about Jesus. And so most of you, including myself, have had somebody in your life a loved one, a friend, somebody tell you about Jesus. And they've told you that, you know what, you need to, to receive him as your Savior. You need to follow Jesus. Most of us have had someone in our life do that. I thank the Lord for my aunt. I remember her, when you went to her house to spend a night, you were going to church. You might as well bring some, don't, don't come over here. Spend a night and think you're not going to church. You're not just going home. We go into church. You spend a night. And I thank the Lord for that because I've never forgotten that. As a, as a, as a 10 year old and 11 year old boy, I remember now looking back. And I used to remember as a kid, you know, thinking, oh my goodness, I just want to spend a night. I don't want to drag me to church. But thank God that they drug me to church. Because you know what? When I got there, God began to work on my heart and began to speak to my heart. Thank God that somebody loved me enough. And I remember my mama telling me that ABCs of salvation as she was trying to teach me how to tie my shoe. And tying my shoe wasn't an easy thing. I remember her getting mad about it. And she was needing a little Jesus when she was trying to teach me how to tie my shoe. But she, I remember sitting there and she was telling me the ABCs. But she would talk to me. But... The voice of a loved one is someone in your life that, has, that loves you, that has been speaking to you about the Lord. And you can look back and see those ones. Because let me say this to you. Everybody look this way. A person that really loves you is going to tell you about Jesus. They're not going to put it off. They're not going to say, I don't, I don't want to offend you. Offend me! Because I want to go to heaven. Amen? And then there's the voice of the loved one. Then there's the, the voice of his own conscience that began to speak to him. So he's got the voice of reason speaking to him that confronted him. The voice of a loved one. But now he's got the voice of his own conscience. In ver and this is, I'm staying in Matthew 27. This is at verse 23 and 24. It says, And the governor said, Why? What evil hath he done? But they cried out the more, saying, Let him be crucified. When Pilate saw that he could prevail nothing, but, rather, but that rather a tumult was made, it means an uproar, he took water and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. See ye to it. So his own conscience was telling him that he was wrong. 
His own conscience was telling him that he needed to do the right thing with Jesus. As you read this, you can, as you read it, if you'll slow down and not try to get your verse in the day or a chapter a day to keep the devil away, if you'll sit down and study and just let the word of God speak to you, you can just about feel his, his anguish as he's going through and as he's dealing with this situation. But his own conscience is telling him to do the right thing. And your conscience and, and my conscience will tell me also that you need to do the right thing. But then there was the voice of Jesus Christ that confronts Pilate in verse 37. This is Now this is John 18, 37. So if you're writing it down, you can write that there. Pilate therefore said unto him, Are thou a king then? Jesus answered, Thou sayest that I am a king. To this end was I born. And for this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. Everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice. So Pilate is hearing the voice of Jesus. Jesus is telling him, I am who you think I am. I am who you say that I am. You heard the voice of Jesus. And you say, well, you know, you may say, well, I've never heard the voice of Jesus. Yeah, you have. Because I just read it to you. That's his voice. He's the word. Jesus is the word. For the word was with God. The word was God. You've heard the word. Jesus just spoke to Pilate and he speaks to you. I am who I say I am. And so here's Pilate confronted by the voices. And so were you confronted by the voices uh, that confronted Pilate. So were you. And then I saw this right here, the, value, the values that can form Pilate. Because see, Pilate had certain pressures on him that fought against him making the right decision. And it's just as you are. As you look at Pilate, so we really parallel his life because we deal with the same things. But see, he had, first of all, he had to deal with public opinion, what the, the public thought about him. In Matthew 27, 20, it says, But the chief priests and elders persuaded the multitude that they should ask Barabbas and destroy Jesus. So Pilate here is being led by the persuasion of the crowd. He was a politician. And he wanted to follow the constituents. I actually said that right. I'm glad. But he wanted to follow those that, that put him there. He wanted to not make anybody angry. And so he said, you know, he's listening to this in public opinion. He wanted to have the public on his side. And we do somewhat of the same thing. Sometimes we base our decisions on what the public thinks. If you don't think that's true, Notice that people on, online and stuff like that, they try to get the most likes. How many people are going to like what I did? I want to put this picture up there so I, I can get likes. And, and, and listen to this. They don't really like you. They don't even know you. But here, Pilate has is got the public's opinion of him. You know, and we deal with peer pressure on a regular basis. I know you that are younger in school, I know that peer pressure is tremendous. Those that you that are at work, wherever it may be, deal with different pressures. Listen to Mark 15, 15. And so Pilate, willing to contend the people, released Barabbas unto them and delivered Jesus when he had scourged him to be crucified. When I give the invitation today, the first thing the devil is going to do, and this is so true, is going to, he's going to say this to you. What will they think about you going up to the altar? What does this church, what are these people going to think about you? And he just preached about this. And if you walk the aisle, they're going to think this about you. And so just like Pilate was dealing with public opinion, you also sometimes make your decisions not based on what Christ wants, but what you think the public wants you to do. But then also we see not only the public opinion, but his position and his possessions confronted him or conformed him. Listen to John 19, 12. It says, 
And from thenceforth, Pilate sought to release him. But the Jews cried out, saying, If thou let this man go, thou art not Caesar's friend, whosoever maketh himself a king speaketh against Caesar. So Pilate didn't want to lose his job. He didn't want to lose what he had. And some are afraid if I follow Jesus, then I might lose some things. Listen to this scripture here in Matthew 16, 25 and 26. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. And whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. For what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Your soul is the most valuable thing in all the universe. It's not gold. It's not diamonds. It's not money. It's not riches. The most valuable thing is your soul is you. You're the most valuable thing. And so you can't, well, you can give up. There's nothing that this world has to offer that's more valuable than you having a relationship with Jesus Christ and you going to heaven. There's nothing more valuable than that. You can have all that this world has to offer, all the riches, all the houses, all the prestige, all the fame and die and go to hell, and that meant what you get gotten means absolutely nothing. What matters is that you have a relationship with Jesus Christ, that He is your Lord and Savior. And then the third thing is this, is the verdict that condemned Pilate. In Matthew 28, 27, 26, it says this, Then released he Barabbas unto them, when he had scourged him, I've read this, but I'm going to read it again. When he had scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. So what does Pilate try to do? He tries to ignore Jesus. You ever try to do that about a situation? Well, I'm just not going to say nothing. I do nothing. And maybe it'll go away. Well, Jesus is not going away. Because listen to what it says in John 18, 31. Then Pilate said, then Pilate then said Pilate unto them, Take ye him and judge him according to your law. The Jews therefore said unto him, It is not law for us to put, it, to put any man to death. So Pilate is trying to put it off. He's trying to ignore it. I don't want to have to deal with the situation. And, and we deal in a society and we deal in a world today that they say this right here. Well, I'm just going to go on through and I'm just not going to say nothing about Jesus. I'm not going to do anything. I'm just going to live my life like I want to. But here's the thing. Jesus is unavoidable. Jesus is inescapable. You've got to make a decision. There is no gray area. You can't ignore him. But then, then Pilate tries to put it off on another person. In Luke 23, 6 and 7, when Pilate heard of Galilee, he asked whether the man were a Galilean. And as soon as he knew that he belonged unto Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him to, to Herod, who himself also was at Jerusalem at the time. So what he does, what Pilate does, I'm not going to make a decision. He pushed it off on someone else. And see, are you guilty of that? Of trying to push off your decision and make your decision by what other people say. Maybe you're allowing the world's view, what the world says about Jesus, be your view. Maybe it's your family's view. I'm always amazed when someone comes out of the, the Muslim faith, it comes out of an, another faith to receive Christ because they didn't allow them to shape their view of Jesus. They allowed Jesus to be their Savior. So I'm wondering this morning, are you allowing someone else to, to try to make that decision for you? But you can't. Because see, here's the thing. It's a personal decision. One day you're going to stand before Jesus and you're going to stand alone before Him. So Pilate tries to shift the decision. But then this is kind of somewhat in, of, kind of in the same area. But then 
Pilate tries to, to be neutral about it. He says this in Matthew 27, 24, when Pilate saw that he could prevail nothing, but rather the tumult had was made, he took water and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. See you to it. So Pilate was saying this, I'm not going to say yes. I'm not going to say no. I'm just going to stay right here in the middle. But you can't stay in the middle. The thing I've noted about trying to be in the middle of something is you always end up hurt when you're in the middle of something. If you're driving in the middle of the road, there's going to be an accident. If you get in the middle of two different people, there's going to be a problem. You can't be in the middle. It's either Jesus or it's not. And you say, you may say, well, I just won't make a decision. I Here's the thing about this. If you don't say anything, you just live it out and don't accept Christ. You've made that decision by not doing anything you said no to. Him. By not do, trying to not do anything is saying no to him. And so let's read our verse. Let's go back to our very first verse that we read today in Proverbs 16, 20. It says, he that handleth a matter wisely shall find good. And whoso trusteth in the Lord, happy is he. So the question comes back to you, what will you do with Jesus? So it's a personal question. There's four things about this question. It's a personal question. It isn't someone else. It isn't what someone else is doing with Jesus. It's not what they're doing. It's what you're doing with Jesus. What are you doing with him? It's what you, it's personal. And then there's the pressing question. Each of us is, will do something with Jesus today. Every one of us will do something. You will either reject him or you will accept him. To ignore him is to reject him. So it's a personal question. It is a pressing question. And then another thing about this question is this. It's a pertinent question. It's relevant because your destiny hangs on how you answer that question. What will you do with Jesus? And then it's a present question because he, he's not asking, or the question is not, he's not asking what had you done in the past or what you're going to do in the future. What are you doing with Jesus right now? And the reason I, I ask it that way is this. I can't tell you the number of times I have been out on visitation as, as the years that I've pastored. And someone will tell me this. They'll say, why? I accepted Christ back when I was 10 years old. But they never done, they, they've not done anything. They've, they, they've lived like the devil ever since. If you have Christ in your heart and in your life, you're not going to live for the world. You're just not going to. That's why the question is asked. Well, what are you doing with Jesus right now? Not what you might do next week, but see, because here's the thing. When I give an invitation, and the invitation goes out for any pastor who gives it, so many times... It's, this is what happens. Someone says, well, next week, I'll do something about it. Next week, well, maybe the crowd won't be as large next week, or maybe the so-and-so, or whatever the, the excuse will be. Well, see, but this is next week to the person that said last week, I'll do something next week. Did you understand that? But the thing about waiting to do anything with him, with Christ, is this. That just as we said when I started off the message to tell you what happened, the tragedy that happened, you don't know what's going to hold, what tomorrow holds. In fact, Jesus had come back in this very service. Do you know him? What will you do with Jesus?